Welcome as we gather to celebrate the life of Tina Paraboom. I invite you to stand as able. You can follow along with the words and the responses printed in the worship booklet. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of all mercy and the God of all consolation, who comforts us in all our sorrows so that we can comfort others in their sorrows with the consolation we ourselves have received from God. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Let us join in our first hymn. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our sister Tina. We thank you for giving her to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see that death has been swallowed up in the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
so that we may live in confidence and hope until by your call we are gathered to our heavenly home in the company of all your saints. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we'll hear words of remembrance. I know there are a couple who are going to come to the lectern to speak. You don't have to touch the microphone. It's already set and we'll pick you up. And as you speak, you may take off your mask to speak. How do you say goodbye to your mother? I've pondered this for the last year, ever since she was diagnosed with leukemia. I'll forever remember where I was when she told me. There are moments in your life that are burned in your memory forever, both good and bad. That was one. As I have tried to answer this question, it occurred to me that you can't and you don't have to. She lives on in who you are every day. She lives on in each of your sisters. She lives on in her sisters. She lives on in her friends. She lives on in all who knew her, loved her, and in all those she knew and loved. My mom touched every person she met. She was kind and caring. She never met a stranger. I remember being so embarrassed when she would speak to everyone we happened upon. Over the past few years, I find myself doing the exact same thing. And as I walk away, I think, oh my goodness, I've become my mother. How wonderful that would be. She was such an amazing woman. Hi, good morning and uh, <clears throat> good afternoon. I'm uh, Rob Paraboom, uh, Bob's son. Uh, quick memory about Tina. Uh, as you know, she took care of my dad for mm. probably three years. So uh, we, uh, when my dad passed, we were talking, just me and Tina. And I wanted to thank her for all she did for my father. <laughs> but, uh, Sorry. She actually yelled at me that day. <laughs> you know, she was very direct. Uh, she said, Robbie, this is about your father. It's not about me. Mm. So today, it's about Tina. <laughs> and I do want to thank her. <laughs> For what she did. It was nice. So, and uh, she's not here now, so I want to thank the daughters Brenda, Linda, Karen, and Sharon. You did an amazing job. Thank you. If there are others who would like to share a memory, you're welcome to. My name is Kay, and I have known Tina since she started coming here to First Lutheran. And uh, we got to know each other pretty good. But my memory of for you that don't know uh, we were part of the group that played trivia on Thursday nights. And um, it was me and Tina and uh, Cecilia 
And a few times her grandson, uh, I believe his name is Robert, is he here? Richard. Richard. Well, anyway, uh, with Tina with her degree and me being a history teacher and Robert having some kind of degree in something, we won a lot. And she would always, she would always come in and order uh, gin and tonic. And it was more tonic than gin because uh, it was in a really tall glass. Uh, but Tina enriched my life. I loved listening to her speak because she didn't have a Texas accent. She had a different way of talking and her vocabulary was different too. But she enriched my life and she enriched the lives of every woman in this congregation and we appreciated her so much and I wanted you to know that. We have a couple more who are coming up. If you'll come to the lectern to speak. Hi, I'm Becky Sykes, and this is Janet Pearsall Thompson, Thomas. And we were in Taekwondo class with Tina and our class leader and actually the whole class decided that Tina has fought hard and we want to award her her black belt first degree in memory of all that she's done. She was one of the very first members of the class when it was developed 13 years ago and she's worked so hard and we really appreciate all her input. She helped us all become better Taekwondo people. So thank you, Tina. And we have a uniform, a black belt, and her certificate for you. Hello, I'm Jen, Tina's travel friend. One of the many, I think. Um, I came to know Tina in Taekwondo class. And we took a break during one of our class days, and <clears throat> someone asked what would be our bucket list at our age. And Tina said, well, I hope to travel. And so the conversation went on, where were you planning to travel? And she said, um, Europe, I, I'm thinking mostly Africa. And I personally had lived in Africa, and had hoped to go back to the area where I had lived and had no one willing to take time off to go to Africa with me. So I said, Tina, let's talk more about this. So the next thing that happened was the very next opportunity in the new year of that time, um, we were buying our tickets to travel to Kenya and, and Tanzania. So that was an adventurous spirit that we both shared. And the trip was ever so exciting. Tina was a traveler, a seasoned traveler, and I had not been traveling internationally probably for about 15 years. So um, it was exciting and new to me, and she kind of led the way. She explained the, the multiple faucets in the bathroom about mm. what the, the hot water, cold water, the turn-off faucet was a third one. And she said, okay, let's, let's make uh, an arrangement where I'll have responsibilities and then you'll have responsibilities. So she was in charge of setting the faucets for our showers. <laughs> and I was in charge of my strong flashlight, pocket flashlight, showing her how to find the keys to the doors of our, our lodging. We were, in, we were on the move, so we had many different doors to unlock and, and relock. So, um, and then I was in charge of uh, lighting the trails that we walked to our 
uh, locations for our meals and all. And we traveled that incredible country together with um, nine other people in um, Land Rovers that bounced the, the dusty trails and in and out of villages. And it was um, a trip to remember forever. Her attitude was such fun, and our whole group loved her stories about her childhood and uh, what brought us all to share that adventure together. She, we, we went on into the um, wild country of Serengeti, and we shared a tent. Our trip was 19 days together, so we came to know one another when you bunked together. <laughs> Um, she was um, fun with the Serengeti trip. We were at night, uh, our lodging was a tent, and um, we could hear, it was dead silent other than the, the natural sounds. And one particular night, we heard a lion mm. and a wildebeest attack and they they sounded like they were right behind our tent and she and I sat up on our bunks and said what do we do now <laughs> there's no place to go I said we we can't crawl under our, our um, beds our mats and so we just sat and stared at each other <laughs> and listened to the the, the battle as it went on and then it was sudden, and then it stopped. And so the next morning, when we all joined for breakfast, we, we understood that it was just behind our tent. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it was all very exciting and memories that I'll treasure forever. We did have a, a tough experience in that just the, the day before we were planning to uh, pack up and return home, Tina fell in the shower. And it was determined that she had injured her back. It was in the middle of the night. And um, so I helped her to her bed, and she stretched out and just stayed very quiet until dawn. And I contacted our leader, and he then went into communication with how to handle such an emergency. We were fortunate to have two nurses with us, retired um, military nurses. And so they joined us at our tent and talked to Tina and did uh, checked her vital signs and really took, took over. And so as it turned out, the, the group had to adjust one of our Land Rovers to accommodate keeping Tina straight and, um, and safe and, and protected so that she wouldn't be bumping too, uh, too much in the van to get her to the airport, which was, I think, about 30 miles from our location in the camp. She um, um, was, was fine. She said um, she had to give up her, uh, her charge card at first, and then she gave me her handbag and she said, oh, I'm just fine. <laughs> I no longer have any money or any ID. <laughs> so whenever she settled into the van, then I returned everything to her. And uh, um, she was transported for about 35 miles to the airlift point and was um, med medically evacuated a, a, into the uh, from there to the city of Nairobi, Kenya. And then she spent four or five days at the hospital in Nairobi. And we were in touch with her through uh, her progress, through um, our, um, our group organizer. And she just, it sounded like she was just so strong and so cooperative and then she contacted me much later and said that she, her stay in Nairobi, the Nairobi hospital was 
a remarkable experience in that they gave her such complete attention and they were also very, very gracious. So I shared that with emails to all our um, group that we were um, traveling with and we were all very relieved. Anyway, um, she went on and was returned back to the States, back to Bush Airport um, through medical evacuation and she said that if she enjoyed the flight because she slept all the way. I, in return, was flying back home in coach, international, and there was no room to sleep, and there was no comfort to sleep. And I thought, well, she's doing fine, <laughs> and I'm, I'm bumping along on my own, very cramped and uncomfortable, and it's a really long flight. However, no, no problem, really. <laughs> So um, as I think of her, I think of her spirit and her um, English accent that I loved and her little stories, and um, I will always cherish that. Oh, by the way, we were in um, Tanzania at the um, one location, one village of the Maasai tribe, and they're the very tall, thin, elegant people and they were very um, interested in having us as guests, and they gave us a tour of their, their lodgings and their life. And then they insisted that we dance with them. And we said, um, well, I don't know, but they, we had no choice. So we danced, and it was simply jumping straight up and straight up and down and um, two drums. And so Tina and I said, well, we dance with the Maasai. It's, I mean, who can say that? <laughs> So, um, a short time that I knew her, I had a truly an adventurous relationship, and I will treasure that forever. Thank you. Let us turn now to the reading of God's Word. The first reading comes from the third chapter of Lamentations. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him to the soul that seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord, for the Lord will not reject forever. Although he causes grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not willingly afflict or grieve anyone. Here ends the reading. Please read responsibly the bold verses from the first chapter of Psalm. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over The second reading is from the first chapter of 1 Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope 
through resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even now, if for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuine, genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Here ends the reading. Let us stand to receive the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus is speaking and says, Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses, was li as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. I want to extend special greetings to those who are joining us from England as well as from Hawaii and Los Angeles and other points around the country. We're glad that you're able to be with us today. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that the sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. It's part of Psalm 1. We heard that a few moments ago. It's a psalm that Tina learned in her childhood if you replace the law of the Lord and understand that to be the way of God's love, it looks like that's what her life has been, seeking out God's way of love in this world. A week ago today, we gathered over at her home. She had freshly come home from MD Anderson. She was laying in a bed. And we gathered around her to plan this, to have conversation and to talk about what are things that she felt important. When I asked about Scripture, she didn't hesitate. She turned right to Psalm 1 and started reading it out and talking about how that had been so meaningful to her because it was one she memorized when she was but a child. Then we talked about hymns as well. Again, there was no hesitation. It was, could you go get that red hymn book? And the tall daughter had to do that because <laughs> it was a pie. 
And it was the old SBH, the old service book and hymnal of the church. And she knew exactly where she was going, finding the hymn that we're going to sing in just a few moments. It was again a hymn that she sung in her childhood at school. And she got quite particular, I believe it is verse 4, that was the one that spoke to her heart. It was just part of who she was. And then she mentioned the Navy hymn, which we came in on, and she said she might start crying, and we had a little conversation about that. Evelyn Tina Cockerham Paraboom was a child in England at a most horrific time in world history. She grew up in World War II. And as she was profoundly shaped by World War II, so her life went. She and her sister Jackie were evacuated from the family, and everything they knew in life, they were removed from. I had the privilege of reading what Tina had wrote about this part of her life and talking about going over to the school grounds and, and then being taken away. And it was all planned. Parents agreed to it to save this generation, to move them out of harm's way from what they anticipated from the Germans. And so she and her sister were put on a train and shipped off to Retford, um, a small town maybe an hour, two hours below Leeds, where she had been growing up. And there they stood waiting as children were being dispersed out to homes. And apparently they were the last two. She and Jackie were the last two because they were, it was instructed they had to go together. They were five and six. Okay, imagine being five or six You've been taken away from your grandmother, from your parents, from your friends, from your town, and you're in this little town with people you don't know, and then these two ladies come out. One had been married, apparently was widowed. The other, her sister, and they said they'd take the girls in. What an upside-down experience for all of them. For Tina and Jackie to have everything turned upside down, the world they knew shifted. For these two ladies that they eventually called, I believe it was mom and auntie, um, their world was rocked too because they weren't used to having little girls in their homes, little girls who were rambunctious, and Tina was rambunctious. I read those stories. She was an active little girl. She was filled with joy and life from the get-go. In her stories, the story of going into church for the first time. Stories of experiencing when the Germans didn't just hit the big cities, but they also dropped bombs in Retford. Stories of going under the stairs into the cupboard as their safe space. And one night hearing, seeing flashes, feeling dust, and then afterwards when the all clear went out, seeing that a bomb had hit over on the London Road. Homes destroyed. The fire was raging. It's hard to imagine what Tina experienced. In all those years, she saw her mother one time. She saw her father twice and only twice because one of those was when he was marching through town with his group. And he, they were so proud because he had his India helmet. I'm not sure what that was, but a special helmet on from his division. It's hard to imagine a childhood like that. At the end of the war, though, Jackie and Tina were again put on the train, this time going north. They got to Leeds, and their mother met them there, took them to the house, and then their world was turned upside down again because not only were they back with a mother that they hadn't seen for many years, there were two other children, younger siblings that they hadn't met. 
What an amazing childhood and a full life right there. I believe that those early years were massively formative for her, forming her into who she was, creating in her the strength and the drive and the zeal and the joy for the adventure of life. She had already experienced so much before she became an adult. But then at 18, she takes off with a friend and her bicycle, and they go to Madrid, Spain. What an adventure. In Madrid, Spain, she met this Texan guy, and, well, you know, eventually that led to making a trip across the pond and moving here and having a life and celebrating four wonderful daughters. In that life, it was her sewing, oftentimes in pairs, maybe the same dress, different color, making sure her girls looked just so, having parties, going to parties, walking to church, living life. And she always had her eye on you all. I believe you're the one that threw the bottle in the street, that mama, they tell you that. Could be. Your mama knew. And then as the girls grew, then her life expanded in new ways, the getting of a job, and eventually learning how to drive. At one point then, she found herself to be single. And over time, the girls who had grown and were doing their thing, she met Bob, a love of her life. And they started a new adventure. They, they moved some, but they did a whole lot of renovating and rebuilding and enjoying life together. Eventually, they were here restoring homes, and Galveston became her favorite place. Then they ended up near Giddings and had land up there and lived up there, and Bob did become ill, and she lovingly, willingly, and probably she yelled at you because she didn't want any attention about it because she didn't think she did anything special even though she did. She took care of him because she loved him. Last week, uh, Stephanie, you were there when he was sh she was sharing a story about um, Bob couldn't really communicate and you were out, they were out and, and he was making noise and he was disturbed and finally it clicked on her. They were, he wanted to go to this one place. I don't remember the detail, but she wasn't put off by that, but rather, what can I do for him out of love? That's kind of how she lived with everyone. Volunteering with Meals on Wheels, volunteering at Libby's Place. You all got that photo of her uh, going in and dancing the chicken dance. Uh, she loved life. She enjoyed going to trivia with her friends over at the dive bar and having a good time. She enjoyed traveling. She enjoyed the adventures. I'm wearing a, a cross from Tanzania because I have been to Tanzania and brought this back, and, and she and I talk some about her desire to go to Tanzania and her going to Tanzania and excitement about the Maasai. Thankfully, she also, after that, was able to go to the Taj Mahal, another one of those pinnacle moments for her and her experiences. Thankfully, in the fall of 2019, she was able to travel to England to visit her family. But on that trip, she was more tired than she felt was normal. When she did get back, she ended up in UTMB. They started doing all the tests. It was determined she had a rare and aggressive form of leukemia, and it was off to MD Anderson, and there the work began, experimental treatments, trying different things, her body being ravaged, her body being weakened. Then at one point after some treatments, the goal was to get her so her platelets would restart, and they never did. What many folks may not realize is that meant that every couple days she was back 
at a clinic getting infusions for over a year to stay alive. And during that time, you, her family, wrapped your arms around her. You should be hearing thank you today. I think she would want to have that being said to you, except she knows that you probably would reject it just as she was not in the mood to get it that day. You all did a phenomenal job of taking advantage of the gift of time to be with her, to journey with her in the most horrific part of the journey. Now, when she was at MD Anderson, this is just fitting for her. It was an issue of you have to give your name, your birth date, 82234, what types your blood, be positive. And that became really just a symbol of what she has always been, being positive in the midst of a world that's not always positive. When she had moved back here to Galveston, she did not uh, immediately move her membership back to First Lutheran. She loved First Lutheran, loved the people here. She was an active part of our congregation. But she did not immediately move her membership back because she wanted to retain her membership at the small church in Giddings because that congregation went through a split. The congregation divided. The issue was that some people wanted to exclude certain people from the grace of God. And she said no. She stood with open arms. One of her mantras in life was, can't they all get along? Why can't we all get along? You see, being formed in her faith and in her life in World War II shaped her to see the world in a certain way gave her an adventuresome desire, but also a grounding in God loves her and loves everybody else, and no one's to be excluded. That's how she lived her life. That's how she made her friends. That's how, that's how she approached the world in a way of trying to love. Not perfectly, for all of us are sinners, but in intentionally trying to be loved for the sake of others. Today, we gather thanking God for her life. The beginning part, there was a chunk that was really difficult. The last 14 months have not been a joy ride. But there's so much more where God's love for her has simply been lived out. Trusting in Jesus' love she didn't act in fear. She acted in boldness. Over the last 14 months, we had conversation about her ending her treatment and concern about would that be suicide? What would that mean? What does what's God think about all that? Last week, the doctors are the ones who said, there's nothing more. And she was at peace with that. At peace because the God who held her and loved her in life said, there's nothing to be afraid of. When she closed her eyes and breathed her last, surrounded by her daughters on Saturday, she went home to be with God where there is no more illness or sickness. She had hoped that she would get to ring the bell, the symbol for cancer patients that they're done with treatment and that they've won. At the close of service today, the bell will toll. She doesn't have to ring the one on the wall. We're ringing the big one up in the tower. We're ringing the bell because she has no more cancer, and cancer did not win. The leukemia did not win. She is safe in the grace and love of God eternally. I pray that you, as her family and friends, as you reflect on her life, See the ways that the love of God was shared in her life with you, in how she served, in how she cared, in how she acted. I also pray that you recognize the grace and love of God that is present for you, that the Holy Spirit is wrapping its arms around you with the promise of God's love, 
hold you and strengthen you. In the coming days, share stories. I've been around the daughters some. I know that they can cry. I also know they can laugh. So laugh, cry, tell stories. And be adventuresome. Dare to live like Tina lived. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to stand. We'll join in singing, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. And verse 4, you take note when we sing that. Those words are particular for her. Let us affirm the Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us join our hearts in prayer. You may be seated or kneel as we offer our prayers. Amen. 
Almighty God, in holy baptism, you have knit your chosen people together into one communion of saints in the body of Christ. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to share the new life in Christ. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Give courage and faith to all who mourn and assure and certain hope in your loving care that casting all their sorrow on you, they may have strength for the days ahead. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and who walk as yet by faith that where this world groans in grief and pain, your Holy Spirit may lead us to bear witness to your light and your life. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Help us in the midst of things we cannot understand to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. God of mercy, hear our prayer. God of all grace, we give you thanks because by his death, our Savior Jesus Christ destroyed the power of death. And by his resurrection, he opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also. And that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come, will be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may, be, you may stand. Let us commend Tina to the mercy of God, our Maker and Redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Evelyn, Tina, Cockerham, Caraboom. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming, Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Let us go forth in peace. In the name of Christ, amen. Let us join in our final hymn. The family will be able to greet you outside on the porch and sidewalk following the service. Mm -hmm. 